Bless you, Lord. Kids, you're already making your way to the door over there. Wow. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise the Lord. We just had an awesome, awesome time of worship. The holiness and reverence of the Lord was in this place. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Who I am excited to share with you today. If you don't know me, I think most of you do. We don't have any visitors. My name is Christine. I'm Pastor Mike's wife. I have three of my daughters here. One is in Buffalo, New York this morning with Warrior Notes. But I want to share some things with you today that are very near and dear to my heart. Some things that have helped me on my journey over the years. You ready for that? You might want to get a paper, pen and paper if you don't have one. Many of you know parts of my testimony, and I want to share a little bit with you today. Not a whole lot. But when I was two, my dad was diagnosed with leukemia from Agent Orange. He served in Vietnam and got leukemia. And he had it for four years, so he was sick the entire, entirety of my life of knowing my father. And then he passed away when I was six. One of my brothers is back there, Carl. Carl, I think you were 10. And we lived up in Massachusetts. Anybody from Massachusetts or that neck of the woods? Got the Bailey family over here. You got Mark. My father worked up there. He was a very intelligent man. He worked in, um, I believe he worked for Procter & Gamble and some of the big companies up there. And my whole family was back in Illinois but we had an amazing community of people around us. So when my father passed away, even at six years old, I did not feel the depth and sting of his death. Because why? Because I had such an amazing church, and we had amazing people around us that came around us and loved us and supported us. That's why it's so important to have a covering. You know, it's not just about coming to church. It's about a covering. It's about somebody as a, in the fivefold that's fighting for you. It's about, that's what Mike and I do. That's what the leaders here are doing. We're, we're fighting for you. We're praying for you. And we had a, an amazing uh, community and friends that were like grandparents to us and aunts and uncles. But my mom, at 31 years old with three young kids, had to make some really, really hard decisions. And so we moved back to Illinois. And it was really, really, really difficult coming out from that safe place. And my mom had to do what she had to do. I understand, you know, you need to be by family when hard things happen. I was born again at a very young age. At, uh, I was actually, thank God, I have very few memories of my father, but one is sitting on his lap watching Billy Graham and giving my life to Jesus. I mean, if I had one memory, that would be the one. And I was filled with the spirit at a very young age. My mom was a single mom, and she said, sit down. You're all going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we did. <laughs> so we, we would pray in tongues, and then me and my two brothers would get together and, and say, let's come on, let's pray in tongues together. You remember that, Carl? We would go in the other room, and it was this uh, interesting language that just fell upon us. And, and so we would pray in tongues together. But when we moved... How many of you know what sometimes when change happens, trauma can hit that you didn't even know was there? I was very safe and sheltered. And then all of a sudden, I was in a new place, and everything, things that had happened to me even when I was a child, the death of my father, everything hit me when I moved to Illinois. It was really difficult. My health started to decline. I didn't sleep for days on end as a child. I, the, the depth of trauma and the things that happened to me. How many of you know how important sleep is? No, I mean really, like clinically, how important sleep is. I visited someone in a um, mental institution one time 
that had not slept for days on end, and it led them in a mental institution because it can make you feel crazy. And I was at that point when I was young. I was, uh, I was not sleeping, and I was having nightmares, night terrors, things like that. And so for the next 10 years of my life, I spiraled from about 6 to 16. And I had a deep internal battle in my mind, my emotions, and then my body started to fail. And at 16, I started bleeding internally with ulcerative colitis. And the enemy used many situations and traumas from my childhood to torment and trap me in. It's okay. It's not going to be heavy the whole time. There's hope. The reason I was so emotional this morning was thinking about me standing before you. As I wrote this, there's not a chance that I would be here today without the Lord. I was deep in condemnation and shame and rejection, disappointment and abandonment. I did not know where this God was that I had given my life to. I had deep disappointment of why my life was not turning out the way that I saw it turning out in other people's life. But I loved God with all my heart. But I couldn't find him or see him through the pain. And these are some things I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you how the Lord brought me out into a wide open space and how there is hope that he will do that for you as well. How many of you know that there are books written about you in heaven? Raise your hand if you know that. If you don't, there are. It's in Psalm 139. You know, I love me some props. I'm sure they're much more beautiful than this. But I like flowers, so I decorated mine with flowers. If you can't see over here. These are some of a little representation of books written in heaven. But this is the thing is when I was knit together in my mother's womb... The Lord wrote all these things, page after page after page of things for Christine. My maiden name was Bruss, so we'll use that. Christine Suzanne Bruss, it means little follower of the Lord. And books, he, he knit me intricately, knit me together. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And everything in those books is wonderful. Creativity and businesses that you're going to start and people that you're going to touch. But what happens in life? What does John 10 10 say? The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come that you'd have life and life more abundantly. See, there's no killing, stealing, and destroying in these books. It doesn't say written in this book that I'm going to cause this little girl to go through 10 years of severe torment just to test her. If anybody ever tells you that, it is not true. God does not cause bad things. He will use things that happen in your life to bring glory, but he does not cause them. It is not written in my books that I'm going to make her sick so I can show the world what the healer is. He's not a liar. He's either the healer or the one that makes people sick. He's not both. So what happened is, is I was knit intricately as you were in your mother's womb. However you got your start here. Whether you were unwanted or wanted by your parents. The father wanted you. And he wrote amazing books about you. But then there's another part of us, which is our what? Our soul. Your soul consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions. 
And when you get born again, your spirit goes from darkness to light. And then you're connected to what God made you. Now you're a child of God. And you can fulfill what's in these books. But what happens is, is the enemy comes in and he starts working to try to kill, steal, and destroy things. See, he can't kill this. But he can sure try to hurt your body and hurt your soul. So that's where we have this. Sorry, Mike, I raided your shed. No spray foam in this one. I did this about 10 o'clock last night. What is this? Stuff. Stuff, trauma, pain, things you've been through, things that have disappointed you, hooks that the devil has tried to hook you in. So we're going to talk about both of these today. And what is this? Us trying to patch it up and cope. Tape it all together. Let's get into the scripture here for a few minutes. Psalm 139. You even formed every bone in my body. This is Psalm 139, 15. Passion translation. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I came to be. Before I'd even seen the light of day. The number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you're thinking of me, how precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. How beautiful is that? Your story, there's, there's songs, there's songs out right now I can't stand. God, you're still writing my story. False. Your story's written. It says in Psalm 139, before you came to be, I already wrote this out. I cannot stand soulish worship songs. I, I don't like it. I'm sorry. If you do, I apologize. It's not my thing. You know, because there's, they're singing things that aren't true. God, you're still writing my story. What does that mean? We're all in trouble if he's still got a pen writing our stories. It says before, before, when you were skillfully wrought in the earth, he wrote your books. So here you are. We're going to say like this is your spirit connected to God's spirit. So here you are born again. With a soul that looks like this. When you get born again, your spirit goes from darkness to light, as I said, and God's spirit comes in and lives within you, within your spirit. You might be like, I know this already. It's okay. It's good to have a refresher. So if you read the New Testament, Paul talks about walk in the spirit, yield to the spirit, be led by the spirit. So what you're doing in this life, in this journey, this is all about the journey I'm going to be talking about. What you're doing is you are learning in your life to not listen and yield to this, but to lean over and listen to God's spirit, which is dwelling in your spirit. You're listening to his spirit inside of you, which is God's spirit is always speaking absolute truth. The Holy Spirit only is saying what the Father is saying. So he's constantly feeding you information directly from the throne of God. People say to me all the time, I can't hear his voice. I can't hear his voice. I can't hear his voice. That means that something is speaking louder than the voice of God in your life. 
because he's always, always talking to you. See, I was really, really messed up inside. So yes, I was born again, but I'm walking around as a troubled, troubled teenager and child, and this is screaming at me on the inside. Trauma, abandonment, rejection. And I'm trying to read my Bible. He sticks closer than a brother. The father will not. You're abandoned. You're rejected. This is screaming at me 24-7. See? I'm falling all over the place. <sighs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Okay. See, I gave my life to God, and I wanted to grow and know him. But my soul had dominated my life. And I want to share some things with you that have helped me along the way on how I am able. Listen, I don't have this 100% figured out. And if anybody says that they do and they've arrived, let's have tea together because I have no idea how you've completely arrived. <laughs> Number one, you got your pen? Number one, know that you are on a journey. Psalm 139.4 says, you know every step I will take before my journey even begins. This one simplistic, kindergarten, basic thing has caught up many people in their Christian walk. Why? Because they want to be at the destination, but they don't want to be part of the journey. I have years and years and years of studying the Bible, learning how to not yield to what's screaming inside of me, learning how to hear the voice of the Lord, being wrong at times. Oh, well, that's not spiritual. No, listen, this is real stuff. Thinking that God told me to do something and I forgot to ask him if it was his voice or not. Know that you're on a journey. This, especially I find the older crowd feels this way. They feel stuck in, I should be further along. So what do they do? I lost time. They live in regret. And they just stop trying. If your heart is beating, you have books that you are to fulfill. Some things in my life have taken 20 and 30 years of plowing and getting in there with the Lord. Well, I don't want to do that. Whose coattails are you going to ride? Because it sure is not going to be mine because I put the work in it. You don't wake up one day and are just passionate and all-knowing and fully healed and delivered and knowing all the Bible. Boy, don't I wish. You have to work out your salvation. With what? Fear and trembling. You lay yourself before a holy God and you say, I'm desperate for you. I'm real messed up, but I'm desperate for you. This is a process. What are we used to? Microwaves. You're sta How many of you have stood at a microwave? It's three minutes and you're like, three minutes. You can't wait for your popcorn to be done in two and a half minutes. We had to put it over a stove in a jiffy pop or in a pot with some oil. That's how... Microwaves came out when I was a kid. I'll just put it that way. We made grilled cheese in the oven. We, we, you didn't have a quick microwave. But this, this mentality of I want it now, I want it quick. And, and I don't like it because people, uh, it, oh boy, I might get in trouble for this one. But people get born again and then they have somebody lay hands on them and say, you're an apostle now. And they're not trained and they're not equipped. And then they go out and they hurt and wound people because they haven't let the Lord work on them. 
Don't pray for me if you haven't been in there with the Lord. I'm just saying, I love that you can prophesy, but you're angry 24-7. All right, I'll move on. Have you ever met an angry prophet? I'm like, you need to prophesy to yourself, brother. <laughs> Mike has told you this. Man, now you got me off on a tangent. Mike, Mike has told you the story before. I, I went to somebody, um, a service where the person was, was prophetic. And um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But... Uh, we were, we were having some challenges with our children. <gasps> really? Are you serious? So we just wanted to go, and, you know, if the Lord wanted to, you know, do something, I was fine. I wasn't going to sit there and beg the Lord. And so he came over to Mike and I, and he started prophesying. But it was very strange because as he was prophesying, something clicked in my spirit. He started in the spirit, and then he started going off on these little tangents in his soul. And I was like, what? It was really weird, and Mike was kind of looking at me, and I was looking at him. I probably just should have said, brother, that's enough. Um, but I sat there, and, and I had it, and I talked to Mike later, and I said, what was that? He said, did you see how he went in and out, in, in, and out? See, what happened was he was seeing things, and he was interpreting what he saw through this. Dangerous territory. Dangerous. Why don't you guys prophesy more here? Why don't you say things like that? Because unless my spirit 100% knows, because there's, there's always human error, right? There always is. I'm not going to lie to you and say there isn't. Unless Jesus is standing before you, Okay. But I could see this man weave in and out of the spirit. But I was mature enough to know that, but some people aren't. So they're weaving in and out and telling you stuff. And you got people moving to Timbuktu because some guy saw Africa. But what if it was a generational curse in their past of something in the line? But he interpreted that through his soul. You have to be very, very careful. You need to learn when you have the gifts of the Spirit inside of you. You have to learn how to walk in the Spirit. Because you can crush people and lead people in wrong directions. Okay, you so you're on a journey. See, what you guys don't know, I'm going to tell you a secret. You want a secret? That's what we're doing Wednesday nights here. We're training you. We're training you. To get in the river and knock it out. That's why I get up and give a little teaching, or Mike and I does, because we're in the we're in the river, we're in the flow of the Father's heart, and then somebody gets up and starts praying about Cuba, and you're like, we're all going this way. What are you doing? That's why we give direction, and we want to see, can you come under the authority of who is leading and go in the same direction as everybody? But the Lord told me this. Well, maybe you're not supposed to say it right now if we're all going this way. So we're training you and teaching you on Wednesday nights to flow in the Spirit, to pray in the Spirit, to not pray and get caught up on your prayer life. Oh, Uncle Joe, Lord, to, who's Uncle Joe? We're praying for the nation. Like, we love Uncle Joe, but don't pray for Uncle Joe right now. Pray for him in your car. Right now, we're praying for the nation. So we're teaching you and training you. So that's my secret. That's Wednesday nights, okay? And if you're going in a different direction, you may get the pastoral hand. What's the pastoral hand? Mark, you want to come up here? I'm going to show you the pastoral hand. That's when one of us walks up, stands by you, stop talking. Thank you, Mark. Or sometimes you'll see us hold the microphone because then we're going to pull it away and say, now you're in your soul. One time I was ministering to somebody and 
you only do this once. You don't make the mistake twice. The Lord said to me, I'm done talking. I was like, oh, that means I'm done talking. <laughs> so it's a journey, okay? It's a process. So even when your soul is screaming and in pain and your emotions, trouble feels bigger than anything you're hearing from God. It takes time to know the voice of the Holy Spirit. You have to get to know him. The Holy Spirit was left here on earth. If you don't have relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're really missing out. I'm not even talking about praying in the Spirit right now. I'm talking about the third person of the Trinity. Ever since Benny Hinn wrote that book, Good Morning, Holy Spirit, I was probably, I don't know, maybe I was 10 or something. I was like, I'm going to know you because you're here with us on earth. And we were not left as orphans. So I want to know who you are. So I spent years and years getting to know the third person of the Trinity. And I'm telling you, sometimes I can feel him walk past me. Sometimes I can feel him lay his hand on me. I'm not looking for goosebumps. I'm, not, I'm looking to know him as a person. He's not a bird. Don't be weird. It took me years to go through the process because I was very wrapped up in my soul. This is all I could feel. Let me tell you something. We go by our feelings so much. I'm telling you, people go to meetings, well, I didn't feel anything. Who cares? Who cares what you felt? Who cares if you had goosebumps? The holiness and reverence of God was in here. I didn't have goosebumps. I felt the reverence of God in this place. But if you're so wrapped up and you're so yielded to what's going on in your soul, you're missing out on the Holy Spirit connected to your spirit. But it was a process. I can vividly remember this isn't a verse, okay? Don't quote me on this. But I vividly remember when about half the time, it was about 50%, about half the time I was in my soul and half in my spirit. And so I'd work and work at leaning into the Holy Spirit. And then it was about 60 and 40% I was hanging on to this. And then it was about 70, 30, and it was more than not. And I liked what it was like when I was in the spirit, I liked what it was like when I was not filled with rejection and pain and trauma. I like that. I don't want that part of me because that's not who Jesus created. That's something the enemy tried to do in my life and in your life. So I remember then it felt like 80-20 and I was like, oh, yes. Because I was walking in the spirit. Somebody asked me one time, do you just like live in the glory? I think he was kind of mocking me though. He's like, do you just live in the glory? I was like, I want to. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> but you have to understand the process. How much of the day, take stock of it, locate yourself. How much am I living in my soul? Take stock of your thought life. How much of my thoughts line up with the word of God? All of a sudden, my spirit took over and started dictating my day instead of my soul. I'm telling you, you guys have such an opportunity in this church to take classes with Warrior Notes. If you can't afford it, you come see us. We'll get you classes. You grow in the Lord. You do something to grow in the Lord. Well, I don't have time. You have time to scroll through your phone. Put it down and take a class. Sorry, I'm a little fired up. We were talking in the leaders meeting, so you get what you get today. <laughs> take classes. Let God change your life. Some of the classes with Warrior Notes are, it's made easy, prayer made easy. Honestly, Kevin was so nice, he could have said for dummies, but he said made easy. Remember those books came out like computers for dummies? 
God's voice made easy. Deliverance made easy. Take classes. They're like 25-minute sessions. You're going to be okay. It's changed my life. So number one was know that you're on a journey. Don't let the enemy put in your head, but sister so-and-so over there, oh, she's just got it all together. Maybe I'm that sister so-and-so to you. That's why I preach and talk the way I do. I was at a hotel yesterday. I can't, I think so. I think it was yesterday. Was that yesterday? Oh, yesterday. I was in Tennessee. And I'm going to be real, real transparent with you. My body was not doing well. I couldn't move. I had worked really hard. And I couldn't, I couldn't get out of bed. And I had to have Mike lay hands on me just to get out of bed. I was struggling. That the body is the other part of this. Because you're three parts. So my body was really struggling. And what happens, anybody that's gone through anything physical, what's the next step? It leans over into your emotions. So now I got two areas, and I'm starting to cry. I'm like, oh, God, I need help. <laughs> I need to phone a friend. <laughs> because my body was struggling, and then, I, and then my emotions were struggling because I didn't feel good. And I said, Mike, I need you to lay hands on me. And I, and I prayed. I had no energy to pray in the spirit. This was yesterday. I'm going to be real with you because this is the process. And I had to pull myself back. I had to rein it in and, and lean over in my spirit and say, body, you're, you're going to be okay. You're going to line up with the word of God. Emotions, wrap it up. I'll give you a couple minutes and then we got to go this way. I had to get on an airplane and write a message and, and minister. So my spirit started talking over to my body and my, and my emotions. My emotions to say, this is the way. Go this way. And sometimes you need to phone a friend in that process. I have two people that I text and I say, you know what? I'm struggling. But you got to be the type of friend that's like, well, well, you shouldn't be depressed today. Well, you know what? I'm not talking to you. Can you handle that? I'm a little depressed today and I need you to pray for me. Absolutely, I'm praying. I'm interceding. Don't act like you don't have a struggle. I'm just saying. 24 hours ago, I was struggling. If you need help on the journey, phone a friend. Find somebody you trust to pray for you. Okay, number two, be willing and obedient. That verse does not say, be willing, and you'll eat to go to the land. Oh, I'm willing to go to the gym, but am I obedient? I'm willing. Everybody's willing to eat good until you got queso in front of you. Janet loves some queso. It was hard when the Lord told me to change my eating habits. I'm not going to lie to you. I wasn't skipping rope. Oh, how great. I can't eat anything. Fun again. I, I didn't feel that way. It was, it was, it was a death. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was a death to my body and a death to my soul so that it could resurrect into health. It didn't feel good. At one point, I drug Mike along on the journey too. We were both laying on the floor, and the kids walked and said, What is wrong with you? Literally, did that happen? We were both laying on. I was like, we're trying to eat right. <laughs> That really happened. That's not a testimony. It really happened. But the Lord told me, I want you to completely cut it off. Because in my mind, I negotiated with the Lord. I was like, well, I'll just cut this out first. And maybe that's good for you. But for me, I had to go all in. And then he said, for, for the rest of your life. I was like, oh, man. But it was a process. It was a process for me because, because I, my soul and my body were hungry. I had to detox from sugar. I had to detox from uh, carbs and grains and all that. You think I didn't want to have a big plate of spaghetti? I had to eat zucchini when my kids were eating spaghetti. 
but it was a process. But the Lord said, be willing and obedient. Then you'll eat the good of the land. I had many, many years of being willing. I would say, yes, you have to give God your yes. I learned to obey without question. I don't have to know why. If God says stand in the center of the supermarket and just stand there, you just do it. Why, God? What if I see so-and-so? Just do it. In the scope of eternity, it's not going to matter if you're embarrassed for a second. Obedience is a process. Obedience, this is something we taught our kids. I don't have to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why, but I want you to obey because I told you to. I want you to obey because God put us over you. And obedience is because I love you and you know that I love you. And you know that I have good for you. If God tells you to do something, it's for his good. I learned to obey without having to know the why and the when and the where and can I afford it and all that good stuff. I did crazy stuff because I was willing. People, when I was in my 20s, I had somebody ask me one time, hey, do you do, um, uh, what was it, TV sets, like design TV sets? And I leaned over to the Lord. He's like, yeah, you do. I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so I remember I went to the Lord and I would say, okay, so this is your idea and I don't know how to do this. So he said, put these chairs here. Go get this and put this here. Do you know how many TV sets I've designed? Just because of one simple yes. Just because I had the audacity to say, why not? It's probably written in my book. But see, we're, we're scared to try. We're like, I don't know how to do that, but I know somebody that does. I know the most creative and intelligent and amazing person that ever lived, and he's standing right beside me. I had somebody said, hey, do you do weddings? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I was, and then I would go to the Lord and I would say, teach me. Teach me. Now, I've also been on the flip side where I said yes, and it was a disaster. And I went to the Lord. I was like, why didn't that work out? He said, because I didn't tell you to do it. Oh, that's the worst. Has anybody ever had that happen? I forgot to ask. <laughs> but there's no limitations with him. If he says write a book, if you don't know how, ask him how to do it. Talk to a publisher. Just do it. Do something. When I was at Brownsville, I, I was very one-on-one -on -one with people. That was my favorite thing to do. And I was part of the student wives because Mike was going to school and, and I wasn't, so I could work and have babies and all that stuff. And um, they said, hey, can you lead this? And I asked the Lord, and he said, I want you to do that. And that was my first women's group I ever did. It was to student wives. But all these little things, all in my life, with the yes, the Lord has carried me through and grown and grown and grown in those areas where I've thrown massive weddings, and, and I've designed sets, and, and people say, where did you get this from? I don't know. I have no idea, but let me tell you something. Gifts and talents are deposited within you, but if you never try, you're never going to find it. My friend Cindy Norman here, she didn't have this burning desire her entire life to do prison ministry. She said yes, and all of a sudden she walked through that door. She, walked, she dared to walk through that door and do prison ministry to all these women. Cindy, as far as I know, you've never been in prison. No, okay, she's never been in prison. <laughs> hey, listen, we all got stuff. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify first. But you don't have to be in that spot to minister. I've, I've led drug addicts. Uh, he wasn't even a drug, he was a drug dealer. I led a drug dealer, me and Todd. Where are you, Todd? We led him to the Lord right where Ian is, right there. We led a drug dealer to the Lord. 
I've never done drugs ever in my life. Does that mean I can't minister to a drug dealer? I've worked with prostitutes. That was one of the greatest times in my life, sitting with drug addicts and prostitutes. I've never done any of that. But I have the spirit of God in me that knows that little girl's name and knows what she's going through. I learned how to cook from my mother. And I stood there as she was cooking when I was a child. And I learned. And then all of a sudden, one day, somebody comes to Mike and says, hey, can you run the whole college cafeteria? And he looks at me and says, can we? <laughs> so me and my mom did all the recipes, and we trained the cooks. And Carl, I just I didn't even remember. You were our breakfast cook. And and uh, some of you probably in this room worked in our cafeteria. We didn't have training for that. But I know the one that knows how it's supposed to work. Hospitality and hosting. There's been many times I've had 50 people in my house. Why? Because I started with two. What does the Bible say? Be faithful what? Little. And then he'll give you much. But what happens is, is the devil gets in your head and says, but I want to be over there or I want to be in stadiums, but you won't talk to the person at the grocery store. He's waiting and he's watching you. He's waiting to see if you're learning obedience. He's waiting to see if you'll talk to this person. He can't put you in stadiums if you can't talk in a grocery store. I'm really thirsty. I'm just, just give me a minute. Number three, I preached a whole sermon on this one time. Do things with excellence. For goodness sake, do things with excellence. What does that mean? Do it to the best of your ability. If you're going to make a casserole, Make a good casserole and use seasoning. Please. White people. Please. Right? I know you're laughing because that's true. If you're bringing a meal to somebody's house and you don't know how to cook, pick you up some Cracker Barrel. Don't, if God did not bless you with cooking skills, do not bring me a half-cooked turkey and some mashed, lumpy mashed potatoes. Just let Cracker Barrel do it for you. Okay, if you're having people over to Thanksgiving and it's your first time doing a turkey, don't do it. Go get you some Cracker Barrel and put it on the table. Add a little extra butter, it's going to be okay. But if you're going to do it, whatever your hand finds to do, what is it? I told my kids all throughout their life. I never once told my kids you have to be in ministry. Not once. I said, if you're going to cut hair, you do it to the best of your ability and you do it for Jesus. If you're a teacher, you do it to the best of your ability. If you pick up garbage, you do it to the best of your ability and you minister to those around you. Because I'm not in the same places that you're at. We all have a circle of people. And if we all ministered and helped those people, what would this world be like? But people are like, well, I'm doing this until. I'm doing this until. Well, what if the Lord's keeping you there until you're obedient and do it with excellence? If you're going to do it, do it right. Do it with all your heart. If you're going to help, help. What does that mean? Don't show up and volunteer and sit in a corner on your phone. I'm not looking at anybody right now. My eyes are closed. I'm just saying, if you're going to sweep, sweep with all your might. If you're going to clean the glass, clean it with all your might. This has carried my whole family and my children through life. I remember they, they do the dishes, and I'd say, come here, come here. Is this your very best? Yeah. Is it really? I'm going to come back in 20 minutes, and I want to see if this is the best of your ability. 
And I would push them and expand them to see how far they could go. And I'd come in and the, the sink, was, oh, I hated that. Ugh. The sink was full of slop after they, they put the dishes in the dishwasher. And I said, did you leave that for me? Because our maid's off for the day. We don't have a maid. Relax. I was talking about myself. And I'd say, if you're going to do the dishes, you wipe out the sink too. If I tell you to sweep, you do an extra thing and you mop. Excellence is so important in jobs, in ministry, in everything. If you're going to preach, preach your heart out. If you're going to drive a bus, pray over every seat while you're doing it. Number four, let God develop your character. Oh, here we go. Let me take another drink. Who are you when no one's looking? How do you treat the waitress? How do you treat cleaning people? Why did I pick those two? Because I've done both. When I go to a store, I don't care if I have to walk to the back of the store. I make my kids do it now. But if I pick something off the shelf, you put it back where it goes. Why? Because I was the one at 10 o'clock at night that had to put your junk away. Somebody has to do that. If you spill something, clean it up. Well, come on, this is so kindergarten. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. One time this happened, and I'm just telling you, as an Antioch leader, I'm going to give you a big secret. If you are not willing to sweep the floor and take the trash out, you will never be a leader at Antioch, ever. You will never be too good to do that. There's been times I have wiped the toilet seat down before I came up to preach. That's called a servant leader. You never outgrow or get too good to do things. That's what I love about Dr. Zadai. Everywhere we go, he, he's trying to help and, and do things. And, and he spent years and years and years doing things behind the scenes. But see, what did Paul say? You got to get somebody else to do that now so you can focus on that preaching. But you always have that inside of you, that if that window's dirty when I walk in, I'm going to clean it. It's so important to develop your character. And I'm telling you, you will ruin your children if you are one way at church and one way at home. The Lord told me that very early on with our children. He said, don't you dare tell them straighten up. We're about to walk in church. What do I mean by that? Oh, yeah, they better not act up at church. They're going to get the mom look, which some of you have seen me do that and actually thought I was mad at you. That's a mom look to my kids. <laughs> Somebody said that was scary. But what I'm saying is, is if your kids see you one way at home and say, mom and dad, they oh, bless God. Lord Jesus, and they're, you know, screaming. Mom and dad are screaming at each other in there. And they walk in, and we're holding hands. Oh, look at that beautiful couple. And your kids are like, they're like, oh, I see how this works. And you're teaching them a spirit of religion. Don't you dare do that. Now I'll take you in the other room and give you a talking to if you act up in church my kids, but we're not going to be somebody we're not at home. Are you the same person at your job? Are you standing around the cooler laughing at dirty jokes and then coming in and singing holy, holy, holy with that same mouth? You have to let them develop your character. You know who they are. Bless God. How you doing, sister? Well, I'm blessed. But you know, that's fake. Don't be fake. Let me ask you something. Are you mean? Are you mean at home? 
Are you mean to your spouse? Because I'm telling you, you have to walk in love at home. You have to love your spouse. Husbands, love your wives as what Christ loves the church. As he laid his life down. Wives, are you nasty to your husband? Are you nagging all the time like a dripping faucet? I said it. I'm just saying. You never and how come and blah, blah, blah. No wonder he want, doesn't want to come home. I can say that because I'm, I am a woman. I hit a nerve. I could feel it. Do you walk in love? I can't tell you how many times I had to go back and apologize to my children. I said, I'm sorry. I got in the soul. I shouldn't have yelled at you like that. Because why? If mommy can do it, then surely I can do it. Because if they're watching me, if I'm getting in my flesh and I'm slamming doors and I'm screaming at them and I say, why are you slamming doors and why are you getting in the flesh? That's not fair. I've had to put myself in a timeout at home. I said, I'm going to go pray in the spirit because right now I'm all wrapped up in this. So mommy's going to go pray and have a timeout. Let the Lord develop your character so you walk in love and you walk in patience. This is something we were talking about in back. Oh, this one gets me. Well, that's just my personality. No, it's not. You're mean. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. This is what we talked about in back. This is a worldly term. Well, it is what it is. That's just the way I am. No, it's not. The Holy Spirit's the deliverer. He sets people free. He can change that quirk in your personality where you can't have anybody tell you anything or you're going to give them the what for. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. I dealt with OCD for a lot of years of my life, obsessive compulsive disorder. Washing my hands excessively. Different things that have happened to me that can cause your, your psychology or your brain to want order. And so I dealt with that for a long time. And I had to work my way out of that because I had a bend towards that. And I have a bend. I had a bend, H-A-D, had, to like an ADD personality. I can't finish anything. Well, it is what it is. She has ADD. Oh, it is what it is. She has this. Oh, it is what it is. So I took it to the Lord one day, and I said, yeah, this is not working. <laughs> so what can I do? I said, Holy Spirit, train me to be able to finish something. Because I would vacuum and leave the vacuum in the middle of the floor. Why? I don't know. I was already on to the next thing. My brain is constantly three or four steps ahead on what I'm doing. Always. I'm talking to you, and I have to really focus on you because I can see somebody over there waiting to talk to me. So I have to rein it in to be able to talk to you. So I said, Holy Spirit, I want you to work on this with me. I said, I give you access. And boy, did he teach me. Christine, <laughs> vacuum. <sighs> Fine, go put the vacuum away. He taught me how to finish things. He taught me how to see things through. There's nothing in you or in your personality that has to be it is what it is. Amen? Because let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit inside of you doesn't act that way. The Holy Spirit is patient. He's kind. It's the fruit of the Spirit. He's gentle. I've gone out to eat with people and had to apologize for their behavior when they left. Don't you dare start talking about Jesus and be nasty. Because you know why? I'm going to tell you something. Waitresses, they can't stand Christians. I'm just telling you, they dread working on a Sunday. Why? Worse tippers, 
and not nice. We got to switch that up. Right? I always say don't go out to eat if you can't afford a good tip. Okay, number five, moving along. Pray in the spirit as much as you can. You'd be surprised how much you can pray in the spirit if you work that muscle. I remember when I um, was in high school, I had a 30-minute drive. We couldn't afford a car. My mom didn't drive. So all the way to my last day of my senior year, I took the school bus. And so I spent four years praying in the spirit for 30 minutes a day on the bus. That's a lot when you're a teenager. But I trained myself to focus on praying in the spirit. And I believe that totally ushered in my marriage to Mike and all kinds of stuff in the future. I prayed for my future husband. It's very, very important that even if you can start five minutes, I started a timer, I remember, and I said, I'm going to start praying five minutes and work my way up from there. Well, they're like, well, that's, that's just goofy. It worked. Sometimes I'll pray one, two hours and just not even blink. I pray when I'm out. My spirits pray in the morning. I'm so hungry to wake up and pray in the spirit. My, my spirit, okay, she's awake. Pray in the spirit. It's so important because you're praying out what's written in here. It's so beautiful. Everybody's hungry and wants to know what's in here. You can literally pray in the spirit and pray this out. And it will come to pass. It's perfect prayers. Spirit, your spirit to his spirit, your heavenly language. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray for you at the end. Okay, I got to hurry. Number six. You put yourself on a path of knowing your father and what it means to be his beloved son or daughter. The absolute central key to your relationship as a believer. This comes through understanding what the, that the word of God is personal to you. Okay, what does that mean? Psalm 139, I want you to meditate on this. You put your name in it. This is for you. The Bible is for you. The scriptures are for you. So this is what I would do. Psalm 139.1. Christine, I know everything there is to know about you. Vicki, I perceive every movement of your heart and soul. I mean, think about it. That's my dad, my father talking directly into me. Don't just read the Bible to read it. You read it as a personal word for you. Quit, quit looking at a prophet. Here you go. Christine, I know everything there is to know about you. There's your word from the Lord. Put your name in the scripture. Christine, I am so intimately aware of you. I read your heart like an open book. I know all your words before you're about to speak, before you even, Christine, before you even start a sentence, a goofy, goober sentence, I know you, Christine. There you go. It's your confirmation. Put your name in the scripture. It's very important. See, the enemy spent years trying to distort my view of the Father. This is the age-old plan of the enemy to confuse you about who God is and what his intentions are for you. All the way back to the garden. Our whole existence as a believer hinges on our relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ as a son and a daughter. This is the central thing. Well, I don't know the Father. Then you get to know him. It's so easy now. You Google all the verses on the Father. And then you sit and you meditate on them. And then you put your name in the scripture so that it's going directly inside of you. The enemy is working overtime to hurt this relationship. He hated seeing the relationship and fellowship of God coming down and having fellowship with man. The enemy hated that. He was jealous. He's terrified for you to understand that you're a beloved son and daughter and a co-heir with Jesus Christ. He's going to do everything he can to get you to identify with what he did to you. This is what he wants you to identify with. Pain, trauma, 
distorted view of the father, abandonment, all of that. Then when you know who you are, then you walk in authority and dominion and understand covenant and all the promises given to you by the father. Romans 8, the spirit of adoption is how we cry, Abba, Father, I speak of it all the time. See, religion, this is the thing. When Jesus formed you and when he wrote books about you, religion says, no, you need to do this. You need to act this way. You need to smell this way. You need to dress this way. But Jesus wants us to connect with the person that he made. And what is the world doing? You got the church trying to do it in the world. This is your identity. This is what you're supposed to think. This is how you're supposed to act. It's this constant pull away from who God created you to be. You have to spend the time to know the relationship. It was very difficult because I didn't get it. And I finally said, Holy Spirit, I cannot do this on my own. Teach me. Welcome, spirit of adoption inside of me, how I cry, Abba, Father. How do I know what's written in these books? I get this question all the time. How do I know the will of God? I'm going to tell you. You ready? Being Christine. That's what's written in here. Being Christine, the true Christine, without all of this. Every day, I am walking in the will of God. What does that mean? The way that Jesus formed me is Christine and you and each one in here is representing the Father. Only you can represent the Father like you can. I'm not a construction worker. I never will be. I hope that will never happen. I will not do a good job. But Ian, Ian's in there. He's tearing things down. He's a construction worker. He's being Ian wherever he goes. He'll be like, yeah, and then this crowd came up to me, and I prayed for this lady, and we did deliverance and anointed her home. That's what's written in his books. Did he say, oh, God, if I could just be in the will of God, if I could just know what's, no, he's just being Ian. He's being Ian without all of this. Because if you're identifying with all the pain, you're wrapped up in that, and you don't know who God made you. That's why inner healing and deliverance is so important. Because you're getting all this junk out of the way, where all of a sudden all you have is your spirit connected to the Holy Spirit, and you're walking in it every day saying, oh, I'm ready, God. Oh, I'm ready. I'm going to Harris Teeter. What do you got at Harris Teeter? Oh, there's a chuck roast on sale. I'm about to make me a chuck roast. Hey, do you know Jesus? I'm just walking. I'm just doing my day with Jesus. That's what's in your books. Don't overcomplicate it by religion. I told somebody I was going to write a book called From Decorating to Deliverance. Why? Because sometimes I'm decorating and I'm designing, and sometimes I'm in the healing room doing deliverance. It's whatever God has for me that day, I just say yes to. That's what's in your books. Don't overcomplicate it. Somebody could help me with that. That would be wonderful. Every day you wake up, you minister to him, and you let him minister to you. Thank you, Janet. Don't steal my books. You have your own. Okay. That'll preach a sermon, right? You have your own book. Why is everybody trying to be like somebody else? We only need one of you. I like stuffed animals, okay? I do. Sue me. I do. I love cuddly, soft, stuffed animals. Miranda, give me a high five. We both do. I told my kids, don't you ever outgrow loving toys. I, be, I go to Target, I look at the decorator, and then I go by the toys. Why? Well, that's goofy. So what? That's who I am. I like flowers. I like flower shoes. I like color. I love antique stores. That's okay. You don't have to. There's only one of me. Oh, I love you. Every day, just wake up. Minister to him and let him minister to you. 
Study the Bible. The more stuff you get out of you, the more you are connected to the real you. Wherever you go, just be you. So many years I was stuck in this thing. I, I don't know where I got this from, but they're like, the will of God, it was like right there. Nowhere else, but right there. How do I get to it? Do you even see it? It's right there somewhere. I couldn't, what's the will of God? How do I get to it? How do I walk in it? It stressed me out all the time. But what I was doing is I was walking in this, this like rejection and condemnation that, that I couldn't fulfill what was in here because I wasn't connected to Christine. So I thought I have to, like the secret place, where is it? All these teaching, and all of a sudden I realized, oh, I'm just dwelling with you, Lord. Uh, it's no secret. It's a hidden place with you under your covering. Because I always said, how come you're there and I'm not? Can you invite me to your secret place? Because I can't find mine. But see, the enemy is always making it a thousand times more complicated than it is. That's what religion does. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. It's just being with the Lord. It's staying in there with the Lord. Same with the will of God. You wake up and you say, here I am. Lord, use me. And if something in your spirit says something's wrong, then move a little bit over this way. Quit stressing out. Tell the Holy Spirit, if I'm walking somewhere I shouldn't, will you just tell me? Because I haven't heard yes or no, so I'm just going to proceed cautiously. I've done that many times. Moving to North Carolina, the, door, the Lord didn't say yes or no. He said, what do you want to do? Oh, Lord, are you serious? I said, what do you want us to do? He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, we would like to live there. And then once I made that decision, because we have free will, he said, you have capped out where you are. He said, you can stay, but you're not going to go any further. So he wanted me to say, I want more. The Lord will ask you questions at times like that. Okay, number seven, we're almost done. There's only eight. It's going to be okay. Number seven, you allow the Lord to continually transform you on a daily basis. When you get born again, like I said, your spirit goes from darkness to light. But your soul does not get born again. It has to be transformed. Romans 12.1. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. I'm skipping around here. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. Be transformed and progressively changed. What does that mean? All in one shot or all the time? As you mature spiritually so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Okay? Every day I go about my day, I'm continually laying myself before the Lord for him to transform me. What does that look like? Okay? I'm glad you asked. As I'm walking, as I'm doing my life with the Lord, all of a sudden, I know you guys have this happen, all of a sudden I encounter somebody. And all of a sudden you feel that, that hook, that sting. You know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. Wave at me if you know. Okay. You're with sister so-and-so or mom or dad or ex-husband calls you or whatever, and all of a sudden you feel that thing. It, it just, hmm. Don't shove it down. What you do is you say, whoo, that hurt, Lord. What was that? And then he'll tell you you still have trauma there. And then you take that, if you don't have time right there, you make a little note in your phone. And when you spend time with the Lord and you say, you know what, there's still something in me there. I'm still hurt at my ex. I'm still hurt at mom and dad for this and that. Or stuff that continually happens in life. Something tries to get a hook in you and you say, 
wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not by the Spirit. What's going on, Lord? And you let yourself be progressively transformed. It doesn't have to stay with you for a thousand years. If something happens today, you give short accounts. You say, nope, I'm not doing that. I clearly felt rejected. Let me deal with that rejection, okay? If it's not a fruit of the Spirit, then there's probably something going on. If you're walking in rejection, if you feel trauma rise up within you, if you want to really, really hurt somebody, ask the Lord why. Ask the Lord, why do I dislike that person? Lord, do I have unforgiveness towards him? And then you take it to the Lord and let him transform you. It's that easy because this is the thing you have to understand. He who the Son sets free is free indeed, then it's no longer part of you. All of a sudden, you feel a little bit lighter. And all of a sudden, you dealt with that hook of trauma, and you're a little bit lighter, and it doesn't affect you like it did. So all of a sudden, God starts unwinding layer by layer by layer, and all the coping that I tried to do in my life, trying to hide and shove all this down, the Lord starts unwinding it. But when it's gone, it's gone. I'm telling you, standing before you today, there's memories that I can't even dig up in my life anymore. They are 100% gone. That's what free indeed means. He's either the healer and deliverer or he's not. The blood of Jesus is so powerful. So all of a sudden, this starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. All this trauma in your life. You read the word. Don't just read the word to read it. You let it transform you. Every time I crack open the Bible, I'm like, ooh, ooh, that was for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Every time. I don't just read it to read it. I read it to change me. It's powerful. It's like a sword. It cuts between the marrow and the joint to say that spirit and that soul. But you have to let him come in and do it. Number eight, you invite his searching gaze into your heart. The Bible says in Psalm 139, Five. So beautiful. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. Hallelujah. There is your hope. I am telling you right now, unless I believe something, I don't want any part of it. I'm telling you that. Unless I experience it for myself, I'm not going to teach you about it. I'm not going to talk about it. I would not be in those healing rooms if the Lord did not transform me. If I did not believe that he was a deliverer and the healer and that he can actually spare you from the harm of your past. I'm telling you, friends, I was 10 years old and I remember sitting on the edge of my bed not wanting to live anymore. It was too much. It was too much in my mind. It was too much in my soul. I remember feeling so bound by condemnation. Every single thing I did was so full of condemnation and religion. I felt like he was this big God in the sky with a hammer and everything I did. He was, why did you do that? What is wrong with you? That's what I thought the voice of the Lord was to me. And it's taken me years to bring this before the Lord. And let me tell you something. I hid this from the Lord, or I, so I thought I did. Years and years and years, I didn't want him to look at it. I didn't like it. I didn't want him to look at it. I didn't like the shame that I felt for things. I didn't like, I didn't like that I was hurt at God. I didn't like that I was disappointed at him. And finally, years and years went by. And I presented myself to the Father. And I said, God, I'm a mess. 
I am an absolute mess on the inside. I know every, listen, I was in ministry. I was in ministry and I was carrying all this around and I knew what to say and I knew how to say it and I knew how to teach and I knew how to preach and I knew how to pray for people, but I couldn't do it for myself. Why? Because I felt ashamed. I should have been further along than this. So finally, I got over myself and over my pride. And I presented myself to the Father and I said, God, I don't even know you. I need you to teach me who you are. You say you're gracious and patient, but everything in here is screaming like you're a harsh and mean father. Everything is screaming that if I do the slightest thing wrong, you're going to leave me. But like Mike taught, it's all filters in the soul. Why doesn't God take all this at once? It's too traumatic. Layer by layer by layer. As we spend time with him, he says, sweetheart, you're taping yourself together to cope. Come to me the next time you feel stressed. Come to me the next time you feel hurt. Come to me when you don't feel loved. Come to me when you feel deep condemnation, and I'm going to tell you the truth. And I would lean into the Spirit of God, and I would read my Bible, and I would meditate on it over and over and over again until absolute truth rose up within me. And I said, wait a minute, that's a lie. All of a sudden, I would get it. You know how when you're doing algebra, and all of a sudden you get it? I would get it, and I would say, wait a minute. You're not going to leave me or forsake me. And then all of a sudden, all these cords start coming out of myself because I was free indeed, and I know that he's a God that's never going to leave me or forsake me. Let me tell you something. The spirit of truth he knows the absolute truth. He will never tell you a lie. If you go to him, he will tell you what you're carrying. He will tell you in your mind, that's me, that's not me. But you have to lay those thoughts before the Lord. You have to say, is that your voice? I talked to somebody precious yesterday, and I said, is that how the Father speaks? And they said, no. I said, then that wasn't him. We have to teach the younger ones what the voice of the Father sounds like. It's so important. I live so much of my life hearing the voice of the Father of lies. He just fed me a line over and over again until I dug into the Word. I would meditate on scriptures. I would put little scriptures in my pocket until they became part of me. And then I was free indeed in that area. Let me tell you something. When, like I said, when something stings, when rejection hits you, when pain, listen, when pain leads you, you're going down a really dark road. If you're making decisions, some people are go after relationship after relationship of people that are hurting them. And on the outside, people are like, why are you doing that? But that's all they know. They only know abuse. They know, only know getting treated like garbage. Until the Lord says, listen, baby, come here, come here. I have so much better for you. I have a godly man for you. I have somebody that will treat you wonderful. You don't have to pick these people just to have somebody lay beside you at night. It's not worth it. So what do you do? It's so simple. This is what we do in the healing rooms. You just say, Holy Spirit, what is this? What is going on in my soul, in my mind, in my will? Is that me? When you're standing in front of the other person, you have to understand that you're discerning. Your spirit is discerning. I was speaking to somebody about this the other day. I will stand in front of me and all of a sudden I will feel exactly what's going on in their life. But because my normal was so skewed for years, I was like, that's me. I'm crazy. That's me. I'm dealing with that until my normal became walking in the spirit. And then I could say, that's you. And I need to pray for you. I didn't say it out loud, but I went to the Lord and I was like, that's not me. But what happens is, is your spirit is always discerning. 
So you'll be in a crowd, and all of a sudden, we got kids in here? All of a sudden, you start feeling sexual spirits, and you start feeling perverse things, and that hasn't been a part of you for years. And then the devil says, oh, they're back in that again. But you lean in your spirit, and the spirit says, oh, no. That guy right there is a homosexual, and nobody knows it. And this person over here is having an affair. So I want you to go into your prayer closet and I want you to pray. You don't need to tell them. You don't need to say anything. I'm just telling you what's going on. But see, when your normal is still wrapped up in all this, the devil starts blaming you for other people's junk. So you constantly have to ask the Lord, what is that? What am I feeling? I was in Tennessee yesterday. I was like... What's going on here? I had, to, I had to go to the Lord. Any territory we go to, things will show up in my room, and I'm like, okay, that needs to go, and that needs to go. And I pray over my hotel rooms because who knows what went on in my hotel room before I got there. So I plead the blood over that. But it's so simple. On a daily basis, you just ask the Lord, what's going on? Why am I a mean person? Why don't I have patience? Why do I want to kill the driver in front of me? Some of you got road rage and it needs to stop. It's not a fruit of the spirit to want to kill other drivers. So you say, Holy Spirit, what is that? Is that me? Do I need to work on something? Do I need healing? Do I need to repent? Is it a generational curse? I'm constantly asking God questions. Because why? He has every answer. He's the spirit of truth. So this is what you do. This is what we do in the healing rooms. If it's something you were involved in, you say, I repent. <gasps> Surprise. <laughs> you say, I repent or I renounce. If it's something the Lord says, listen, you have unforgiveness. Lord, forgive me for the unforgiveness. Help me to walk in forgiveness. And then you invite the Holy Spirit in every area that that dwelled before. That's it. That's healing and deliverance. That's all you have to do. And sometimes the Lord will take you through seasons where it's every day and every night. And he's doing a quick work inside of you. It says he sings songs of deliverance over you in the night. Sometimes I'll wake up with revelation of something the Lord shows me. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. There's another layer gone. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me? Can I get a little music up here, please? Everybody okay? There's so many times that I take people through healing in the healing rooms and they're battling things for years and years and years. And as soon as I get before the Lord, he says to me, it's because of something that was done to them. And there's so many things that the, the enemy, what he does is he tries to hurt you and then blame you for it. It's very evil. It's very sinister. When abuse happens when you're young, when violation happens. He will try to hurt you, and then what's he do? Then he tries to put in a hook of perversion. It's so evil. You could feel it during worship. God was doing a deep work in us. God was doing a deep work in here. The Lord wants to help you on your journey. You are not alone. I'm telling you, your mind, your will, and your emotions, it's not a bad thing. God gave you emotions to feel. He gave you your mind to be intelligent and to think and to discover. He gave you emotions to feel, to our body to feel the sun on our face and to explore creation and all these things. But the enemies tried to come in and taint things. But I am a living, breathing, walking testimony of freedom. 
you can have freedom in your mind. My mind was so cluttered with torment and he set me free. He is no respecter of persons. It's not because of the call on my life. It's because I stayed in there with the Lord. I said, God, I don't want this. What do I need to do? Things played and played and played over and over in my mind. And finally, I had revelation. And the Lord showed me things that had happened in my childhood and I was completely set free in an instant. Things in my body, I was on medicine and steroids and this medicine and this medicine and no better and no better. And I leaned into the Holy Spirit and I said, what is this? And he said, you're carrying abandonment in the depth of your belly. And it was affecting my gut. And he started with deliverance and healing and my body followed. I want you to look this up when you get home, but we're going to pray it together right now. Psalm 139, 23. I don't want you to pray unless you're ready to invite him in to your heart. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about he's about to come in and examine you. Not to hurt you, but he's going to come and say with his Holy Spirit flashlight and say, let's work on this now. Let's work on this layer. Let's talk about this trauma. Let me show you how amazing the blood of Jesus is because he's about to set you free. And if you want to invite him in, I want you to pray this prayer. This is Psalm 139, 23. Say, God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through find out everything that may be hidden within me put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares see if there's any path of pain I'm walking on and lead me back to your glorious everlasting way the path that brings me back to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that the path brings us back to you, oh Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord. What's written in our books is good. We thank you, Lord, that you're working on all this to deliver us and set us free, Lord, so we can fulfill what's written in our books, oh God. Father, I thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite in the spirit of truth right now. If there's anybody in this place that is not filled with the spirit, I want you to come up if you want prayer. I'm telling you, your life will never be the same. We got people to pray for you to be filled with the spirit. The other part is, if any of this, if you feel like the Lord is working on an area inside of you, I want you to come because you just prayed and the Lord wants to examine you through and through. Oh, will you come forward so we can pray for you? Don't be bashful. Come on, just walk up. Walk up and say, Lord, I need help. I need healing. Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. others just pray in the spirit for a moment. There's many others in here. Don't be afraid. I know you can work on it at home, but let's take the step. Let's take the step towards the Lord and say, Father, I'm a hot mess. I need help. I'm desperate for you. I need you, Jesus. I can't do this without you, Lord. Oh, they may see Oh, Nabasa Katanaba Shodi Abekia Katanaba. Oh, leaders, would you come and pray for those that are up here? And if you need to be filled with the Spirit, I want you to tell, tell the person, uh, leader.